Uh, good evening, dear friends. Um, Vida and I are really grateful to the Association for Baha'i Studies uh, to this wonderful meeting. And I am, must say I'm also very happy to have my friend, Mr. Lampel, in these gatherings. We live, friends, in exciting times, pursuing the central aim of the nine-year plan, uh, learning how to release the society-building power of the faith in ever greater measures. The mutually reinforcing relationship that exists between the overall work of the Association for Baha'i Studies, as we heard, and the endeavors of the wider Baha'i community is one of our strengths. And it is my special joy to be amongst such a distinguished audience tonight and to share some thoughts on the message of the Universal House of Justice addressed to the Baha'is of the world dated 28 November 2023 as it relates to the nine-year plan. Um, 19 months into the nine-year plan, we received this message, message of 28 November. And I think a few words reminding us of some aspect of the history of the faith will uh, help us to appreciate better the significance of this letter. As we all know, the first 77 and a half years of the history of our faith is designated as the heroic age. The period during which the manifestation of God lived among us. The period in which the seed of the newborn message had been incubating. The period in which the cause of God underwent a transformation from the religion of a relatively small community of believers to a universal religion whose teachings had reached every continent. The period in which the divine guidance for a new vision, for a new stage in the overall development of humankind, that's the unification of human race into members of one family, was given to the world. A spiritual springtime was ushered in in the cycle of human civilization. The perfect exemplar of a life lived according to these teachings was gifted to the world. Humanity was called upon to adopt a posture of learning as its approach to moving forward and the path to witness the efflorescence and ultimate fruition of the revelation of Baha'u'llah was drawn. That path was to be carved out during the formative age, as you know, during the formative age of the faith. The formative age, friends, as testified by the guardian, signalized the arrival of the moment when that, and I'm quoting, that world vitalizing spirit of God that was born in Shiraz, was fanned into flame in Baghdad and Adrianople, and subsequently carried to the West, was to incarnate itself in institutions designed to canalize the outspring energies of that same spirit and to stimulate its growth. The formative age, in the words of Shoghi Effendi, is the historical period in which the institutions, local, national, and international of the faith of Baha'u'llah were to take shape, develop, and become fully consolidated in anticipation of the golden age designed to witness the emergence of a world embracing order enshrining the ultimate fruit of God's latest revelation to mankind. A fruit whose 
maturity must signalize the establishment of a world civilization and the formal inauguration of the kingdom of the Father upon earth as promised by Jesus Christ himself. The formative age, therefore, can be said to be the period in which systematic efforts is undertaken towards the formal inauguration of the kingdom of God on earth. And we are living in that age, dear friends, under the guidance of the Universal House of Justice. The formative age, as attested by the Universal House of Justice, is that critical period in the faith's development in which we increasingly come to appreciate the mission with which Baha'u'llah has entrusted us to deepen our understanding of the meaning and implications of his revealed word and to methodically cultivate capacity, our own and that of others, aimed at putting into practice his teachings for the betterment of the world and thereby ushering in the golden age of his dispensation. The formative age um, began in 1921 when Abdul Baha passed away and the provisions of his will and testament became operational. Um, in a letter written on behalf of Shoghi Effendi, we read that at least a century of actual working of the will and testament is needed before the treasures of wisdom hidden in it can be revealed. In another communication, the Guardian says, we must trust to time and the guidance of God's universal house of justice to obtain a clearer and fuller understanding of Abdul Baha's will and provisions, and implications, sorry. Friends, the letter of 28 November represents the guidance of that God's universal house of justice as the, after a full century of the operation of the provisions of that will. And how privileged we are to receive it today. So, um, studying it, friends, uh, we realize that in addition to giving a new vision and a path to achieve it, Baha'u'llah has also established a system, a system, capital S, Shoghi Effendi uses it, that contains all that is needed to enable mankind to reach its destiny. Uh, Shoghi Effendi describes the system as the system unfolded by the hand of Baha'u'llah. And the Universal House of Justice refers to it as divinely conceived arrangements. Abdul Baha, whose views, perspectives, and indeed whose entire life was born of what Baha'u'llah had revealed for humanity, elaborates the details of this system and explains how we are to shoulder our responsibilities to fulfill Baha'u'llah's vision. Uh, Shoghi Effendi, who throughout his life assisted the friends to understand the revelation and to learn how to build the path towards achieving the vision of Baha'u'llah, refers to three charters of the faith. The Tablet of Carmel revealed by Baha'u'llah, and the Will and Testament, and the Tablets of the Divine Plan penned by Abdul Baha. He explains, Shoghi Effendi explains that these three uh, charters have created three distinct yet interdependent and mutually reinforcing processes. And the 28th November letter 
that is structured around the operation of these three uh, charters help us gain a better understanding of the implications inherent in each of these three documents for the general development of the faith and for building the capacity to do what is expected of us. Um, among the questions that the beloved guardian asks in his letters of uh, world order, uh, there are these two questions. May we not, he says, meditate upon the supreme grandeur of the system of Baha'u'llah in this day? And may we not pause to reflect upon the sanctity of the responsibilities it is our privilege to shoulder? The letter of 28 November, friends, assist us to reflect on both these questions. Because it helps us to understand better how the operation of the system envisaged in the Kitab Aghdas has indeed guided the progress of the cause over the past 100 years. And it assists us to comprehend better how this system is the agency through which the building of individual and collective capacities required to translate Baha'u'llah's revelation into reality will take effect, enabling every generation to rise to the challenges of its time. The letter, a reflection on the first century of the formative age, reviews the range of capacities developed in the Baha'i community over the past 100 years, demonstrates how much it has been achieved, points out how much remains to be achieved, and clarifies that the nine-year plan outlines the tasks that lie immediately ahead. So the letter offers much in the way of assisting us to become more effective protagonists of the divine plan. Uh, but tonight, I will hopefully be able to share my personal understanding on just two points. One is, or the first one, I would talk about how Baha'u'llah's revelation has and will continue to enable the Baha'is of the world in every generation to successfully carry out the share of their responsibility which is assisting humanity to move ever closer to its divine ordained destiny. And the second will be the implications of this statement of Abdul Baha that the pivot of the oneness of mankind is nothing else but the power of covenant. So um, having appeared as the promised one of all ages, and the manifestation of God for the age in which humanity will transit from its collective adolescence to its collective maturity, having appeared to accompany and lead humanity to its ordained destiny, having diagnosed the ills afflicting mankind, and having revealed his healing remedy, Baha'u'llah says what God has ordained in this age was never intended to reach or to benefit one land or one people only. And that it is incumbent upon every man of insight and understanding to strive to translate that which has been written into reality and action. Seen in these statements, friends, is his invitation, is Baha'u'llah's invitation to the peoples of the world to actively participate in the process of translating his vision into action. How could otherwise the building of a world based on unity and oneness be undertaken without benefiting from the insights of those who have experienced endless discriminations? How could a world based on justice 
be built without the participation of people who have been the subject of countless injustices. How could such a world be built without the insights resulting from raising generations of younger people who are not only to advance the process, but also to refine it? Paola also points out that the old world order is lamentably defective, that his divine system has generated and will continue to generate the spiritual forces needed for the transformation of this world into a better world, a transformation that will be facilitated through the participation of the peoples of the world, and that that his system is designed to make this participation possible. He has additionally, as we all know this, explained that his religion is not a congregation we are to join, but rather it's the path to a new life for human race and that it is the responsibility of humankind in this age to learn how to live that life. So in this connection, it is in this connection, friends, that he has given a special mission to his followers. But the mission is not to do the work for or on behalf of the peoples of the world. Rather, the task is to engage our fellow citizens in implementing the divine plan. They become protagonists of the divine plan. Abdul Baha, the appointed uh, interpreter of Baha'u'llah's word, elaborated how we should play our role in fulfilling the vision of Baha'u'llah. In Paris, he told the friends that God, and I'm quoting him, God approves of the motive of our gathering together to learn how best to work for the good of humanity. He, on many occasions, as it is in his writings, has expressed great joy at the news that the friends, and I'm quoting him, have organized meetings to learn how to teach the faith. Encouraging the Baha'is in Iran to establish Baha'i academic schools in every city and village, he told them when the first school in a city was developed and made to flourish, then more and more schools can be established. So in another word, learning was the approach that the master emphasized. The formative age with the beloved guardian began when Shoghi Effendi assisted the Baha'is to become more systematic in adopting a posture of learning. The 28th November letter explains the way this process worked. It says, on each vital matter, the guardian would provide direction and the believers would consult and strive to apply his guidance, sharing their experiences with him and raising questions when they face perplexing problems and difficulties. Then, taking into consideration the accumulating experience, the guardian would offer additional guidance and elaborate the concepts and principles that would enable the friends to adjust their action as needed until their efforts proved effective and could be applied more broadly. You are very familiar with this. The letter explains the processes that the Baha'i community underwent during the first few decades of the formative age, how the capacity built under the guidance of the guardian resulted in the formation of the Universal House of Justice and allowed the Baha'i world to take on a host of new questions 
about how it was to carry on the work of the faith at a greater level of breadth and complexity under the direction of the Universal House of Justice. Consequently, the community made marked progress over several decades as it faced additional challenges arising from greater opportunities related to the future direction of the cause. And this, in turn, equipped the community to face additional challenges for a further period of development that was focused on achieving a significant advance in the process of entry by troops in all parts of the world. And perseverance in applying this approach caused, as the letter explains, the emergence of a common framework for action by the final years of the century of the formative age, a framework that informs, as we know today and experience it, informs thought, gives shape to ever more complex and effective activities, and it has now become basically central to our work. The 28th November letter identifies for me, therefore, the elements of this capacity building power of the faith of Baha'u'llah. And I would mention it here briefly. Unwavering faith in the truth of the words revealed by Baha'u'llah. Unfaltering trust in the vision and infallible guidance of the head of the faith. Unshakable resolve to transform the various aspects of one's life according to the patterns set out in the teachings of the faith and unyielding determination to translate the divine teachings into reality through a process of action and reflection. It is in this way, friends, and I really recommend that we read and study the letter of 28 November in such a way that this becomes our, it, you know, it's, we internalize this process. Because the letter then says, it is in this way that the capacity for learning how to apply the divine teachings was gradually cultivated and set the believers and the community on a path of learning. And today, friends, 161 years after the declaration, public declarations of Baha'u'llah in Baghdad, the community under the guidance of the Universal House of Justice has consciously grasped this process of learning and has extended it worldwide from the grassroots to the international arena. In the words of the Universal House of Justice, it is this growing capacity to resolve complex questions and then to take on still more complex questions that characterizes the process of learning that is propelling the progress of the faith. Thus, the House of Justice uh, further explains, it is evident that with every step forward in its organic unfoldment, the Baha'i world develops new powers and new capacities that enable it to take on greater challenges as it strives to achieve Baha'u'llah's purpose for humanity. And so it shall continue to be. And so it shall continue to be through countless stages of the formative age and the golden age to the end of the dispensation is the promise of the Universal House of Justice. This divine reassurance, friends, and this clarity of vision about the capacity-building power of the cause of God 
should and would serve as a tremendous source of confidence, enabling us to see better the fact that the prosecution of the divine plan in our own clusters, wherever we live, as the means by which long-term, and I'm quoting the Rezvan message, we see the, the prosecution of the divine plan in our own clusters as the means by which long-term constructive processes unfolding over generations are being set in motion in every society. Abdul Baha explained, so this is about the process of capacity building in us and in others. Abdul Baha explains the profound spiritual concept of the development of inherent capacities. He says, um, in a living organism, the full measure of its development is not known or realized at the time of its inception or birth. Development and progression imply gradual stages and degrees. The whole of the great tree is potentially latent and hidden in the little seed. And then he notes that when this seed is planted and cultivated, the tree is revealed. And he makes use of this analogy to explain how the potential in humankind can also be cultivated. So reflecting on what uh, Abdul Baha says, we can understand that for the potential of, the, of a seed to flourish, it requires water and light, and it should grow under the care of an experienced uh, gardener. A seed in the company of thousands of other seeds, like itself, and without the inputs from sources external to it, will not germinate. And it will be unable to develop its potential. Humanity, likewise, needs inputs from sources external to human realms. That is the light of the sun of truth, the life-giving water of the divine revelation, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to succeed in building its capacity so as to enable it to attain its ordained destiny. How reassuring, therefore, it is that our Baha'i community is striving to systematically execute the three divine charters as it does this, it has become a new creation as anticipated by Abdul Baha. How reconfirming to know that the way we implement the divine plan today under the guidance of the Universal House of Justice reflect precisely what Abdul Baha wants us to do as communicated in his letters, in his talks, in his will and testament, and of course, in his tablets of divine plan. How motivating to know that our present day community building process conducted in a learning posture is set to grow organically and ultimately develop into further efforts that will enable humanity to establish that ever advancing civilization foretold by Baha'u'llah. And as we all know, friends, um, what the Baha'i community seeks to develop is a learning process animated by the words of God that is deeply rooted in nobility of man and in the oneness of humanity. And it is systematic in its approach and scientific in its method. The process will continue to mature over time as we learn how to learn. And once it has been further refined, once its results are further widespread, 
once it's brought to the attention of those who are unaware of it, and once it is examined by the world for its manner of functioning and its effectiveness, it should attract attention throughout the world for the promise of success that its approach holds. So at some point, we also need to learn how to introduce it to the world. So as for the implications of the covenant in relation to the work of the protagonist of the divine plan, friends, I see them also well connected with the learning process we have been talking about. Uh, maintaining a posture of learning over century-long periods, when I think about it, it requires special strengths. And among them, the capacity to have a growing and clear understanding of the bigger picture, so to speak, uh, which in this case means an evolving understanding of the vision of Baha'u'llah. A capacity to maintain the integrity of that vision while remaining flexible in approach. The capacity for an immovable commitment to remaining coherent to the vision, regardless of the dictates of our personal interest or the worldly forces. The capacity to reflect on certain questions that would inevitably arise. Questions such as, where were we in the early days of Baha'u'llah's revelation? How did we get to where we are today? How has been the nature of the path we have trodden? How easy has it been? What sacrifices it entailed? Where are we now in this process? What insights can we draw from our previous efforts that will assist us to be more effective in what we are doing today? Um, what have we learned from the changes the Baha'i community has undergone? What else do we need to reflect on? Questions are many. What have we learned from the process of the dialectic of crisis and victories? What can we learn from the mysterious harmony of the operation of the minor and the major plan of God? the two known ways in which his purpose for mankind seems to be working. Where are we going? What will illuminate our path over the next five, nine years, six, seven years, over the next 25 years, and further into the next century? These are required, really, thinking and reflections. What are some of the provisions provided by the wondrous system of Baha'u'llah, as Shogh Effendi calls it, that has guaranteed the coherence and the success of our work so far? The 28th November letter addresses all these questions, friends, and more. It stresses the importance of efforts to foster the spiritual and intellectual developments of the believers. It sheds light on the fact that a deeper understanding of the covenant gradually emerges as the faith evolves continuously under the guidance of the Universal House of Justice and marches along the path of its destiny and clarifies that a deeper understanding of the nature of covenant and the strength born of firmness in it are essential. A deeper understanding of the nature of the covenant and of strength born of firmness in it are essential for generating insights and sustaining efforts for maintaining unity and achieving progress. 
These are profound concepts, friends, that this letter uh, assists us to understand better. So we all know, friends, that Baha'u'llah has established a covenant for, with his believers, and we know that, and we are familiar with its main elements, and we also know that Abdul Baha perpetuated that covenant by laying down the provisions for the administrative order, thereby ensuring the continuation of authority, leadership, and the flow of divine guidance to the Baha'i world and to humanity until the end of Baha'i dispensation. And this was to be done through the twin institutions of the guardianship and the universal house of justice. One of the issues that has become clearer during the first century of the formative age is that Baha'u'llah's covenant indeed provides for two authoritative centers, the letter explains. First is the book containing his divinely revealed words as well as the authorized interpretations of these words. And second is the Universal House of Justice, an institution under the care, protection, and unerring guidance of the Bab and Baha'u'llah, an institution vested with responsibilities, powers, duties that encompass all that is necessary to ensure the fulfillment of Baha'u'llah's purpose. How this clarity should assist us to march forward with confidence. So with this clarity, friends, we realize that the existence of the book means that the, during the entire Baha'i dispensation, the revelation of God for this age, unadulterated by humans' misinterpretations or addition, will remain accessible to all mankind. And in addition, and at the same time, the Baha'i community, through various provisions of the covenant, will continue to be in the forefront of the progressive movements in the world, ensuring, safeguarding the advancement of humanity to its destiny. And the study of the 28th November letter helps us internalize this fact that complete coherence to the covenant of Baha'u'llah is the only means whereby the Baha'i community and humanity will develop the ad adequate strength to integrate capacities, talents, insights, and efforts of individuals, as well as the inspirations of the communities and the plans of the institutions into a collective progressive order culminating in that anticipated civilization foretold by Baha'u'llah. The covenant of Baha'u'llah, as we all know, is destined to preserve the unity of his followers and to maintain the integrity and the flexibility of his teachings. This is how and why the day inaugurated by Baha'u'llah will not be followed by night. Meaning that in this day, the religion of God will not decline. It will not become a source of conflict and harm to mankind, but will rather remain a powerful instrument for cooperation to propel advancement of civilization. So this categorical assurance is given to us by Baha'u'llah himself, and it is repeatedly restated in the Baha'i writings. And what a source of empowerment, dear friends, that today we stand engaged in the implementations of the nine-year plan, witnessing how the capacity in the covenant has propelled the Baha'i community in the span of only 100 years to embrace the entire humanity, to be an element of society in almost all the countries on the planet, 
and to empower peoples and nations from every corner of the world to engage in a learning process aimed at building a society shaped by the divine teachings. All of this occurring knowing full well that in the words of the Universal House of Justice, the integrity of the cause of Baha'u'llah remains ever secure. The tireless labors of the community during the first century of the formative age make it possible for us today to grasp more completely the significance, the purpose, and the inviolability of the covenant of Baha'u'llah. The letter helps us to understand. The letter says, foremost among the achievements of the past century is the victory of the covenant, which both protected the faith from division and propelled it to embrace and contribute to the empowerment of all peoples and nations. So we can readily perceive the letter of 28 November as indeed, that's the feeling that you get, indeed as, the, as a celebration of the victory of the cause of Baha'u'llah. Further related to the question of covenant and being the pivot of the oneness of mankind, um, is a deeper understanding of the fact that while change is inevitable aspect of organic growth, it is the power of covenant that guarantees coherence. Um, consider the changes that the community underwent during the heroic age, that is from the days of the Bab to the time of Baha'u'llah, and then to the ministry of Abdul Baha, when uh, the transformation that then went from the days of uh, Abdul Baha to today, the period that we have made great strides forward in the uh, establishment of the world order of Baha'u'llah, administrative order of Baha'u'llah. And so even if at every of these stages a few individuals may have not been 100% sure of these changes, today with the benefit of reflection, with the benefit of the guidance of Shoghi Effendi and the elucidations of the Universal House of Justice, we are able to comprehend that all these changes and all these stages represent nothing less than successive and coherent acts, as the letter says, in a single divinely unfolding drama based on the design of Baha'u'llah for the future of mankind. You know, friends, the way Persian carpets are made by hand offers me an inspirational analogy of the way the cause of God progresses. Um, and let me explain what I mean. Can I have the first photo, please? If you watch the actual making of a Persian carpet by hand, you will normally see a solid frame within which a collaborative process is going on amongst a few people who appear to be simple and unsophisticated individuals. They work hard to weave the weft into warp by making one small knot at a time, constructing the carpet one tiny row at a time. Often music is played, use of arts, to increase the intensity and the harmony of the work done. The secret of their success, friends, lies in the nature of the extraordinary process in which they labor harmoniously, adhering to the instructions of the one who is providing guidance. The workers looking to the front see a set of warps placed lengthwise with no pattern or no design. But looking behind them, however, 
They see the changes the materials have undergone and observing to their joy a magnificently intricate pattern, stunning colors, and superior quality. The letter of 28th November, for me, is showing us the portion of the carpet made so far, helping us look back and see what a wonderful result we have as the result of the hard and sacrificial efforts over the past 100 years under the divine guidance emanating from the provisions of the covenant of Baha'u'llah. Friends, consider the 10-year crusade of the beloved guardian. At the beginning of that mighty plan, the importance of its overall aim, the urgency of achieving its goals were not clear to everyone. The significance of forming local spiritual assemblies was not widely understood. Nor was the role of keeping statistics over the number of and the locations of such localities fully appreciated. But what made this unique undertaking a great success was the loyalty to and love for the guardian which prompted the friends to arise modifying when necessary their way of life in order to do what each could do in response to his call. The sacrificial efforts of the friends at home and in pioneering fields released a multitude of spiritual forces that were instrumental in transforming hearts, in raising up the Baha'i communities, and in greatly expanding the number of Baha'i institutions throughout the world. These sacrifices and these wide-ranging achievements created the conditions that enabled the establishment of the Universal House of Justice. A critical stage of the divine plan was successfully carried out. The cause of God entered the new stage in its progress and its ability to guide mankind. And at the end of the 10-year crusade, the friends could look back and see what a beautiful carpet they have made by following the guidance of the beloved guardian. It is simply impossible to imagine that they would not have responded to the challenges set before them, and even more difficult to imagine the consequences of that inaction. This generation of Baha'is, we all know, the House of Justice has mentioned it, will always be remembered with a special measure of love and appreciation. Our recollection of some of the stories of sacrificial services of these friends from the East and the from the West during the 10-year crusade will most assuredly, friends, will inspire us to follow their footsteps, re-examine our way of life so as to better prepare to serve the needs of the faith and the needs of the community during the nine-year plan. That same process of the 10-year crusade is at work today. Whatever our understanding of the nine-year plan may be, with our love for the Universal House of Justice, and with the trust in its assurance that, and I quote the Resbound message, the methods and instruments of the plan allow every soul to contribute a share of what humanity needs in this day, millions of Baha'is as well as those attracted to the vision of Baha'u'llah, are striving in thousands of clusters in every continent of the globe to learn how to release the society-building power of the faith in ever greater measures. In brief, friends, by demonstrating the efficacy of the system of Baha'u'llah, by pointing out the logic and the coherence of the path that has been tread since the inception of the faith. By outlining the developments 
attained during the first century of the formative age by drawing to our attention the vastness of the areas where the community has gradually become engaged in the plan's endeavor, as well as noting, as well as noting and bringing to our attention how the turbulences in the world at every stage of history have caused the doors to be open for the spread of Baha'u'llah's message, the letter of 28 November reassures every believer that not only his revelation has provided all that is needed to fulfill Baha'u'llah's mission and vision, but that the divine hand is at work protecting the community, guiding the process, and illuminating the path stage by stage. And our individual and collective effort to expand our understanding of how the cause of God moves forward, how the faith evolves, and how the three constant protagonists of the plan each have a role to play will enable us to be much better poised for our services during the next few decades. And we will know better what will be our part in translating the teachings of Baha'u'llah into action under the direction of the Universal House of Justice. And internalizing these vital points will also assist us as students of Baha'u'llah's teachings to avoid approaching his writings in isolation from the system which he himself has designed for their implementation and which is so very integral to his message. Uh, friends, these were the two um, points that I promised I will talk. Uh, I don't know whether I have a bit of more time just to conclude. <laughs> Okay, it won't take much longer to conclude. <laughs> uh, the letter of 28 November, friends, concludes with a section on prospects for the future. A prospect which should further motivate us to redouble our efforts in the implementation of the nine-year plan in our clusters wherever we live. But I thought that as it may be sometimes difficult for individuals to imagine such a bright outlook for the whole world, or even at times for our own cluster, if very large numbers are not yet involved in the conversation, um, I decided to share with you the concept of prospect in relations to one of the clusters in Zambia. And I am particularly pleased to do so, uh, knowing that there are amongst you tonight a distinguished American family who for many years served as pioneers to Zambia and rendered invaluable services, among other things, contributing to the building of the administrative order of Baha'u'llah in that country and in the very cluster to which I'm referring. So if I could have the second uh, photo, please. OK. The area is called Minilunga, one of the most remote parts of Africa, with still very little infrastructural facilities even today. The people belong to the Lunda tribe. The faith was introduced to this region in 1960-61 with signs of entry by troops evidenced in 1963. During the first 30 or so years, the faith spread, the believers gained a deeper understanding of the cause, and the administrative order was established in that region. In 1996, the friends embraced the institute process wholeheartedly, and in 1997, their newly established regional Baha'i Council began to systematize their learning, focusing initially on the multiplications of the core activities and then on how to invite an increasing number of people from the wider society 
into the courses of the training institutes, therefore fostering their active participation in the community building process. Today, the community has 10 lines of education for transformation, as they call it, and invites large number of people from the wider society to each of these lines of action. Some of the traditional leaders in the region have stated that the Baha'is are the only people in this area who appear to have a clear aim in life and are able to work toward achieving it. Yes. <laughs> and the most senior leader has expressed his willingness to work with the Baha'i community towards changing those traditional beliefs and practices that hamper development. So, with the encouragement of the Universal House of Justice, and of course as their capacity kept evolving, these friends have now become engaged in reaching out to the larger Lunda population in Zambia and in the two neighboring countries, Angola and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And as we all know, at the start of the nine-year plan, it is this cluster that was given the bounty of building its local Mashrugolaska. In short, friends, this is the prospect that the House of Justice is talking about. In short, by responding wholeheartedly to the revelation of Baha'u'llah, by following the guidance of the Universal House of Justice, and by working hard, a population whose vision some 60 years ago, I would say, was focused entirely on surviving the daily challenges of material life, today has become a source of hope, aspiration, and constructive influence to the society around it. That such a process will advance in every cluster is the promise of the Universal House of Justice. The quality of our efforts to implement the provisions of the plan does influence how soon the cluster may witness such a progress. Our community building efforts, friends, again, the guidance of the House of Justice tell us, will be more effective when they are augmented by a deeper understanding of why the message of Baha'u'llah is indeed the sovereign remedy for every disease that humanity is afflicted by when we have the realization that the larger the numbers from the wider society participating in our activities, the stronger the process of community will be, and when the work becomes the concentration of the life of a sizable number of people in the cluster. We live in North America, and the news of impressive advancement of the process of so many clusters in this beautiful continent is really heartwarming for me, as I have the bounty of visiting a few other clusters. The establishment of the first national house of worship in the Western world now being constructed in Canada, friends, I'm proud to say, <laughs> is one of <laughs> to me, it is one of the indications of the vibrancy of the Baha'i community in North America. Uh, we live, Vida and I live in a cluster in Western Toronto where some people might say the population is not receptive to the faith. Um, however, as part of a small group of friends who are striving to learn how to apply the provisions of the plan, as the House of Justice has told us to do, I have been personally amazed at the receptivity that exists there. In my personal reading of our reality, friends, 
in where we live is that the nine-year plan is what we need and what the society needs. And the greater factor limiting progress in our neighborhood is not the receptivity of the people, but rather the amount and the quality of time, energy, and concentrations that we apply to work. Four years into this effort, friends, uh, we have around 120 people in the concentric circles of our team. Uh, 75 of them participate in different core activities. We have had seven declarations, and we have five people from the wider society that you could say they are protagonists of the plan. One of these five, a lawyer by profession, whose spiritual journey has brought her to be now an agnostic, who loves the Universal House of Justice, says the messages of the House of Justice speak to me for the betterment of the world. She helps as her activities, she helps organize regular meetings of the study of the messages of, of the House of Justice for Baha'is and people from the wider society. And when we explored extracts from the 28th November with a number of our contacts, this woman said the existence of the House of Justice and the flow of its guidance make her feel the betterment of the world indeed certain and possible. Another contact in response to study of the 28th letter, a social worker married to a Baha'i for a long time who describes himself as a person who did not entertain much hope for the future of the world, in response to the study of the letter, said the contents of this message and the story of the capacity building process of the Baha'is during the past 100 years he said, make me very hopeful for the betterment of the world. <laughs> A delegate to this year's national convention in Canada, France, we had the bounty of being present as an observer, reported that one of his friends has told him that by knowing the Universal House of Justice, and I'm quoting what we were told, I feel I have discovered the secret of universe for progress. I'm sharing, friends, these personal experiences to illustrate how people's heart and soul respond to the guidance of the House of Justice. And as we learn how to talk to people about the provisions of the nine-year plan as a framework for action for those interested in fostering the betterment of the world, we also should realize that it is important to learn how to let the world know about the Universal House of Justice, that mighty institution that Baha'u'llah has gifted to mankind. After all, friends, receptivity to the oneness of humanity is on the rise. I think we all agree with this. And most people, once they know, they would rather have their lives be less affected by the order that is being rolled up and more increasing, increasingly shaped by the one new one that is being rolled out in its stead. It's a reality. So at such a critical time, friends, in history, shouldn't it be, isn't that obvious that our focus in every cluster must clearly be on learning how to remove our own inhibitions of teaching the faith and how to help people in the wider society to see why they too should be active protagonists of the divine plan. 
The 28th, uh, so that was the conclusion. Now I'm ending. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because this letter of 28, it's difficult to stop talking about. <laughs> it ends, friends, with several stimulating remarks as far as I'm concerned. One of them is the knowledge that, as the House of Justice says, the world is, in truth, moving onwards to its destiny. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful news to have. Wonderful, not news, wonderful divinely inspired confirmation. The world is moving towards, onwards to its destiny. Another one is the reminder, as it was mentioned earlier, of the assurance of the beloved guardian in 1938, saying that the potentialities with which an almighty providence has endowed the divine plan will no doubt enable its promoters to achieve their purpose. He's talking about us, the promoters of the divine plan. The potentialities that God Almighty has endowed these divine plans will no doubt enable its promoters to achieve their purpose. This is combined with this assurance that the progress of the divine plan are the best way we can offer a haven of refuge to the peoples in the hour of their realized doom. I don't know, friends, what else do we want to hear from God. <laughs> and yet another promise that is even for me more exhilarating is when the House of Justice, uh, I think uh, Fariba touched on this, when the Universal House of Justice reminds us of the promise of the Guardian in 1938 to the Baha'is of North America, saying that the time would come when they would be, the Baha'is of North America, would be called upon to engage their fellow citizens in a process of working for the healing and the betterment of the world. And then the House of Justice adds its own divinely inspired reassurance, saying that that time has now come, not only for the Baha'is of North America, but for the Baha'is of the world, as the society building power inherent in the faith is re released in ever greater measures. That is the nine year plan, friends. So these and other Confid I would say confidence-generating remarks are given to us, friends, in this mighty letter, while at the same time we are reminded of the descriptions of the world by the Guardian as a visionless, faithless, and restless society. And I think if there is one part of the world that is easy to see the truth of this description, we live in it. <laughs> We are given these reassurances when at the same time in the Rezvan message, the House of Justice says, with every passing day, the conditions of the world grow more desperate, its divisions more severe. The escalating tensions within societies and between nations affect peoples and places in a myriad ways. And all this, of course, we internalize and understand it in the context that in November 2020, the House of Justice says the decade ahead are set to bring with them challenges among the most daunting that human family has ever had to face. So given the situations of the world, friends, we can take great comfort Yet in another assurance voiced by, at the end of this letter by the Universal House of Justice, um, telling us that on the one hand, none can anticipate precisely what courses the forces of disintegrations are destined to take. 
But on the other hand, one thing is certain, the process of integration will also accelerate. So friends, how fortunate we are that by grace of Baha'u'llah and under the guidance of the House of Justice, we are able to place our focus on the work that accelerates the process of integration. The Supreme Body, friends, as we all know, points out in its Rezvan message that the situation of the world demands from every conscientious soul a response. It clarifies that for us that the community of the greatest name cannot expect to be unaffected by the travails of society, and yet though it is affected by these travails, it's not confused by them. It is saddened by humanity's sufferings, but not paralyzed by them. Um, I am confident, friends, that each one of us, not paralyzed and not confused, <laughs> is reflecting on how to intensify our response to the imperatives of the nine-year plan in our own clusters. And what's the call of the Universal House of Justice? All must search, but the youth must soar. Is the call of the House of Justice in this historic Rezvan message. So while conditions do vary from cluster to cluster, it's my personal understanding that if there is one field in which the efforts of everyone can surge right away is in the field of teaching the cause to others, presenting the faith, the message of Baha'u'llah as a remedy for the ills of mankind and the community building process as the way to learn how to translate this vision into reality. So the House of Justice clarifies that Teaching the faith embraces many diverse activities, all of which are vital to success, and each of which reinforces the other. The work of the Association for Baha'i Studies, whether in helping to advance the intellectual life of the community, whether in promoting a more effective participation in the discourses of society, whether in assisting individuals to present to a world skeptical of religion, the Baha'i views on a number of issues affecting the construction of social order, are all essential tasks of the divine plan as they serve to assist those concerned about the future of humanity, to examine the faith and the message of Baha'u'llah with sincerity and seriousness. And I'd like to conclude tonight <laughs> by reading, this is the short paragraph from the House of Justice. <laughs> by having all of us in mind, friends, this quote on teaching the faith, a letter from the Universal House of Justice dated 1982. The House of Justice says the responsibility of the Baha'is to teach the faith is very great. The message of Baha'u'llah is God's guidance for mankind to overcome the difficulties of this age of transition and move forward into the next stage of its evolution. And human beings have the right to hear it. Those who accept it accept the message, incur the duty of passing it on to other fellow men. The slowness of the response of the world has caused and is causing great suffering. Hence, the historical pressure upon Baha'is to exert every effort to teach the faith for the sake of their fellow men. Thank you, friends.